Stay tuned for Common Sense, where today we're joined by Pat Tackett talking about flood insurance. Welcome back to this month's edition of Common Sense, the TV show here at the University of Rye Grand on Channel 17. That's sponsored by Ohio Valley Bank. Uh, with this show, we talk about different issues that are related to the banking and business industry. And uh, Ryan, today we've got a, a great topic for discussion. Yeah, and it's really fitting for the the weather we're having right now. We do. It's uh, already rained about an inch outside. Under a flood warning and forecasting two to three inches over the next 36 hours. So yep. So maybe we'll get some useful information from this. And and, and hopefully not some applied information. Right. Not as well. applied. That's right. We so, don't want that. Anyway, today's <laughs> guest on the show is Pat Tackett, and Pat is the vice president of corporate banking at Ohio Valley Bank. And Pat's going to share some information with us about different types of flood insurance, which is a big part of many loans that oh, yeah. are made, especially. Yeah. In this part of Ohio, we're yep. you know we're along to the river and a lot of the tributaries and empty ends. So a lot of lowlands and fields. A and lot of lowlands yep. and fields. So, Pat, welcome to the show. Glad to have you back on here today. Thank you, gentlemen. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, why don't you start out telling our viewers a little bit about yourself and your background and okay. your time with the bank and as you, you mentioned, um, I am uh, with Ohio Valley Bank. I uh, work in our corporate banking area. I do commercial lending. Um, I have been with the bank for 35 years. Uh, I've uh, kind of worn a lot of several hats over that time. I've worked uh, in a capacity of a collector, uh, a retail loan officer, branch administrator, worked in loan operations, and most recently I've uh, joined our commercial lending team about six years ago. So okay. that kind of brings you up to current date with, uh, with myself. Okay. Very good. So you got to hit all the different areas of the bank on the way. I, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have a good, strong base. <laughs> That's a good thing. <laughs> Well, um, you know, today's topic is flood insurance, and um, you know, we've got a lot of requests. Um, you know, we get a lot of requests. I think we're having a technical difficulty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, so back to our topic, <laughs> flood insurance. <laughs> well... You've got a lot of experience dealing with flood insurance, working at the bank, being a commercial lender, um, you know, with all your past experience. So maybe just start out and tell us a little bit of you know, what is flood insurance. And okay. Um, thought I'd start out today and give you just a little bit of background on that. Um, flood insurance uh, came into existence uh, by the uh, passage of the National Flood Insurance Act by Congress in 1968. Um, what that did was that created the National Flood Insurance Program, and um, the NFIP, as it's referred to, um, allowed individuals, uh, homeowners, and so forth to purchase uh, flood insurance through the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, uh, that remained in effect um, up until about 1973, and then the uh, Flood Disaster Protection Act was uh, put into place by Congress as well. Um, that one had a little bit more teeth in it uh, in that it uh, uh, mandated coverage for people that um, had homes located in a uh, special flood hazard area. Um, uh, you know, they were required to get flood insurance if they were borrowing monies against those homes. And uh, that uh, stayed into, pretty much stayed into effect up until um, recently, uh, back in 2012, and this kind of gets into some a uh, uh, little bit uh, more current events, but the uh, Bigger Waters uh, Flood Insurance Reform Act was passed, and um, up until that uh, legislation was passed, the flood insurance uh, program wasn't, or premiums, wasn't really based on risk. It was just uh, the government had this program, they would look at the uh, amount of flood insurance coverage you wanted and, mm -hmm. and analyze that, estimate if it was the correct amount. You would get a uh, standardized premium through the U.S. government, you could have flood insurance on your home. Um, we all know, we've all heard of all the uh, uh, events that are, uh, uh, hurricanes and, and different flooding events in our area and so forth that have been out there. And um, one of the problems with not having a risk-based uh, uh, program was that by uh, uh, 2014, the uh, NFIP was in debt at about $24 billion. So, wow. so that, uh, uh, so they, you know, with placement of the Bigger Waters Act, it started, it started making premiums where they were more risk-based. And 
uh, a side effect of that was many, many people had premiums just skyrocket. I mean, they went out of sight. And um, shortly after that was passed, the uh, Flood Affordability Act was passed along with that. And what that did was that backed kind of uh, backed the program up a little bit, and it allowed um, uh, property owners who had previously had a flood policy in place to take advantage of a grandfathered uh, premium amount. So mm -hmm. they weren't uh, actually hit with all the increases. And it also uh, accounted for some subsidization for other, other policies that people were getting. And mm -hmm. I guess with the thought of it's better to have some coverage than no coverage, and the government realized that it was a, was a real sticking point with the passage of bigger waters. So. Sure. Okay. So with what you just said, the, um, does everyone pay the same? The prices are, are different now based on the risk and right. the, the elevation. And, right, right. Okay. And uh, you know you can get into um, uh, get into that a lot, but basically, yeah. basically flood insurance is um, is, um, is is just another type of property insurance. Okay. Um, all it does is it covers uh, it covers uh, for specific events that for flood for flooding in a nutshell. Um, uh, so that's yeah that's but it, but you can get into um, different pricing uh, when you're when you're looking at your pricing on these things um, you have standard risk policies and you have preferred risk policies. Uh, standard risk would be based on a um, based on a property that's located within a 100 year floodplain, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and you're going to have a more um, uh, a higher premium and a standard risk than you are preferred. Preferred risk policies come into play when you're outside that 100 year floodplain, could be in a 500 year floodplain and so forth. So yeah, mm -hmm. uh, premiums are a little, little better on the preferred. Okay. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about um, what constitutes a flood what, and maybe go into a little more detail on what the 100 year or the 500 year floodplains are. Well, basically, um, basically, flood uh, for flood insurance purposes is, a, is defined as a, uh, a temporary condition uh, of partial or complete inundation um, of two or more acres of land, and uh, two or more properties uh, have to be involved in that. And it can be caused by um, any overflow of inland or tidal waters. It can be caused by um, any unusual and rapid, rapid accumulation of, of any runoff waters from any source, and also from mud flow. Okay. So. So it's not always living on the coast. I mean, it right. could be, uh, right. you know, as we were talking before uh, the show, it could be, um, you know, if you live on a, the side of a bank on a deep holler that gets a lot of right. runoff or, or quick flows. So exactly. That could, that exactly. could be included also. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, uh, how can someone tell if they uh, are need, in, need flood insurance <clears throat> or required to have it, or where could they find a flood map to determine, make that determination themselves? Well, the, the, to answer the first part of that question, um, if whether or not you're required to have it, mm -hmm. if you are uh, borrowing money from a federally insured uh, lending institution, um, we have an obligation and a regulation to, um, to monitor that. So if you come in and make, a, make out a mortgage application, part of our underwriting process is going to be to order a flood determination on that property. Mm -hmm. And when we order that, um, <coughs> The uh, flood maps are, are, are one-dimensional, so you mm -hmm. know they don't take into into account topographical changes, things of that nature. So, if any part of the property that you're purchasing is located in a special flood hazard area, then it's considered all in, and uh, you would be required to have flood insurance. Now, there are ways that you can you can um, work around that. Um, if you can prove the structures are out of the flood zone and maybe you've got land that, that, that joins a river or a stream or something that is prone to flooding, but the house is up much higher and things, you can, you can uh, work to, to correct that. Um, as far as finding information, one of the best sites to find that on or best locations would be the FEMA Flood Map uh, Center. And when you go out there, you can actually, you can actually uh, go to that site, you can enter your address, it will provide you information on the flood prone uh, areas around you. It will allow you to go out and get, um, get uh, quotes for premiums for flood coverage. Um, uh, there's a several resources on there. It'll also, uh, it also offers you the ability to find agents uh, in the area that will provide flood coverage and so forth. So it's a, it's a, good, it's a good place to go to look for information and um, um, one that I would recommend to check out before you, either before you buy or as you begin to shop for homes in the in those in certain areas. And you can find that map online. Yes, yes. Web, um, FEMA if, website. It's yeah. If you go if you go out and uh, if you go out and look at the FEMA Map Service Center, mm -hmm. it'll bring that information right up to you. Okay. 
<clears throat> so, uh, you know, something else we talked about, and just to uh, uh, give an example, I think we're going to make a microphone switch. So, uh, you know, one thing we talked about is I bought my house 15 years ago. Right. And uh, I didn't, I wasn't required to have flood, flood insurance, insurance at, at the, the time. time. Right. So, I go back and refinance because the rates are great. And then now I have to Lo have. Lo and behold, there's a new yeah. restriction that's placed on the property and yeah. things have changed. Yes. Right. Can you explain that a little bit on why that would be? Yeah, if, what, what happens on, on, on that, uh, Ryan, is you get into a situation where, like you said, you, you bought your home, it wasn't, uh, flood insurance wasn't required because you weren't located in one of those special flood hazard areas, but uh, just as the weather changes and the uh, flooding events occur, those maps become updated, and once, uh, you know, it could be updated, and, and, and once it is, it may prove that your property is in a flood zone. And then uh, once that is determined, then the, the, the banks and so forth, we're all notified that, uh, that um, you know, if there's a mortgage out there, we have to go back to our borrowers. We have to share that information with them, which is not a pleasant thing to do, but, right. but, yeah. um, but, we, but we are required to do that. And, and, it, and it helps to ensure they have adequate protection and, the, and that the bank has adequate protection to prevent a loss against the loss of flooding. So uh, once, we, once we get that notification, we, we share that with our borrowers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think it's all just a part of trying to make things more predictable and more accurate, you know, making sure that mm -hmm. things are as they should be. Yes, yes. So, and, and there's probably properties that may have been in a floodplain that may not right. be in a floodplain. Well, and I think a perfect example of that is if you look just not uh, too far back to the Houston floods and, and things like that, mm -hmm. there was a lot of people there, I'm sure, didn't have flood insurance and probably felt their properties were never going to flood. But that's when right. you have those uh, huge amounts of rain and right. in a short period of time, I mean, water goes places maybe it's never been. So, right. yeah. Well, I think people, you know, <coughs> really don't realize some of the different infrastructure projects that have happened within our country over the past 100, 150 years. Mm -hmm. With you know all the the dams and the the rivers, uh, big, you know, you know, you look at a lot of our Ohio state parks. Right. Uh, even the big lakes that are in the state parks were developed for flood creation. Right. I mean, flood for control. flood. That's right, flood yeah. control. Yeah. Because they really kind of protect those areas that are downstream yeah. that were very prone to mm -hmm. Even the locks and dam flooding. system on the, on the river. Sure. Yeah. And that's all part of that whole, <laughs> yeah. the whole, yeah. that whole system. And actually, yeah. just today, I met with a client this morning, and they, they <coughs> live in uh, Wheelersburg, mm -hmm. down close to the river. Um, they said that he's never seen that part of the river as low as, as it was today in the wintertime. And he's lived there for 30 years. So um, I assume the reason is because they knew we were probably going to get six inches of right. rain over yeah. the next so couple of days. So they that were right. holding basin yeah. and yeah. prepare for yeah. Yeah. more. Yeah. It'll be full in a couple of days. It will. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned um, you know, natural disasters, let's say, mm -hmm. and the people in Houston, for example, that you know, they didn't realize that they would be in the flood zone, but they did get flooded. Um, won't federal disaster funds, uh, when we get hurricanes and things like that, do federal disaster funds come in and, and help? Well, federal disaster relief is, is you know, I think there's a lot, of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of misunderstandings out there. Although federal disaster relief uh, can help, um, it's not always free. Okay. Uh, first of all, I mean, a lot of times that money is, has to be repaid. Um, the second thing is that um, federal disaster relief alone may not be enough to uh, cover the losses that you sustain. The, um, uh, one of the things about uh, residential mortgage loans, uh, if you're just a homeowner, not a business owner, but a homeowner, the residential uh, maximum of flood insurance is $250,000. Uh, per structure. So, so if your house is worth four hundred thousand dollars, and 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 we like I said, we keep mentioning Houston there. But if you 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 know a lot of those homes I remember seeing on TV were were uh, some pretty expensive homes. Right. Uh, and if they even if they had a full policy, it was only going to cover them up to a maximum of two fifty. So, you know they may need to look for uh, some additional coverage, um, but certainly would want to have uh, the, the maximum on something like that. Okay, that's good to know. And, and a point we might <coughs> talk about. Uh, and the difference between flood insurance and homeowner's insurance. So if a water pipe breaks in my basement, flood insurance does not kick in. Is that I, correct? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a pass on that okay. one. Um, that, that, the reason I say that is um, uh, generally, generally that, 
I think would be a true statement. Okay. Your, your, your flood insurance is not intended for, 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 um, uh, for that type of an event, but, but you, you know, depending on what you and, and your agent have worked out on your policies, um, uh, you, know, you, could, you could have uh, coverages built in to cover those, okay. those types of events. So my basement gotcha. flooded wouldn't be the correct term. Right. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> yep. So we talked a little bit about um, residential properties, commercial properties, or are, are, are they similar? Yeah. Basically, they are. The, uh, the the main difference on them is the amount of coverage, and on a commercial property, you can have a half million dollars in coverage versus mm -hmm. two hundred fifty thousand okay. on a residential. So, but okay. but generally, the program works works the same. Okay. So, and then you know another type of property would be rental property. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I own a rental property. Is it my responsibility to carry the flood insurance, or is it my tenants? If if you if you own the property and you and you are the landlord, um, and if you have borrowed money against that property and it's in a flood zone, you would be required um, to have flood insurance on that. Okay. Um, one of the one of the things, as far as from a tenant perspective, I would say is just like a tenant is required to, or not required, but should have their own hazard policy, mm -hmm. you know, to cover against fire, theft, and those types of things. A tenant that lives in a structure that's located in a flood zone should go uh, uh, and talk to their agent about a flood policy to cover their contents as well. Okay. So it's uh, it would just be good practice. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you. It, Obviously, you can't buy too much insurance. Right, right. Right. So, right. Um, so, just different. Um, you know, to go to the bank. Yes, you need flood insurance. Does the bank offer a, a flood insurance product, or is that something that you can go to your local insurance agent, or how do you? Right, you right. The bank, the it? bank doesn't uh, offer flood insurance uh, for sale. Some banks offer different hazard policies, things like that. But flood insurance is something that's handled through your agents, and um, you you uh, <clears throat> used to be um, up until recently, <coughs> you were only able to get a uh, NFIP policy, National Flood Insurance Program policy. Um, that has changed somewhat. Now you can also um, uh, go to agents. Some agents have private issue companies that will that will issue flood insurance policies. Now those policies aren't guaranteed, uh, you know, by the NFIP by you know FEMA, but they are um, they are reputable insurance companies and in offering that type of coverage. Um, uh, typically, if you if you get a uh, if you go to apply for a flood policy. For an NFIP policy, you're probably looking at about a 30-day waiting period. So if you go to approach your agent, say, "Hey, I need, uh, I'd like to get a policy on my property," usually you give them the information. It'd be about 30-day wait. Uh, whereas private issue, sometimes about 10 to 14 days. Um, if if the bank's requiring a policy for a new loan, um, typically there's not a waiting period. Uh, they just they you know it's a requirement of the loan, and the and the and once they gather the information they need, they'll go ahead and issue the policy. So. so I know you don't, you know, really deal a lot with those policies once the, the loan's been made and the, the homeowner has their own policy. Right. But do those policies, you know, like your homeowner's insurance, it kind of fluctuates year by year. It kind of steadily goes and changes. Are those, the flood insurance policies kind of changing on a year by year basis about what your premium might the, be? They, they do, they do uh, uh, have increases on them. Um, as far as uh, any standard percentage, I don't think there's anything out there you can put a finger on, but, but they, they will undergo changes as well. Okay. Um, the, the NFIP policies are, uh, premiums on those are dictated by the government, so they're, um, you know, more standardized premiums. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, the private issue depends on the insurance company and, mm -hmm. you know, and how they want to set their pricing on it. Okay. okay. So, uh, you're a lender, I'm a recovering lender, um, <laughs> and we've, we've both been there, I know. Um, you know, you notify a, a borrower, hey, you're in, or maybe you've already got the loan on the mm -hmm. books and they're refinancing, what, you find out that they're in, mm -hmm. and they refuse to purchase, or they don't do it within a certain period of time. <laughs> what happens at the okay. bank level? Um, um, at, at, at our level, if uh, as we're as we're tracking uh, as we're tracking, we we have to set up tracking for all of our insurance, both hazard okay. and flood. So, right. so if we if we receive a, a lapse in coverage on a flood policy, um, uh, regula regulation requires that we begin a it's called a 45 day notification process. Mm -hmm. um, we send out a letter the day we get that. We send a letter out to the borrower. Um, they have 45 days to provide us a policy, um, or we'll force place coverage on that. Um, and we have to force place because not that we want to, but we it is re it is uh, required by regulation that we have coverage on that. So therefore, we have no choice but to force place. Um, what we 
what a lot of people uh, may not know about forced place coverage insurance is it does nothing to protect the borrower. Um, it's strictly a policy that protects the interest of the bank to make sure our loan balance is covered. The other thing that the, that the borrower needs to know is that they pay for that coverage. That, that, that uh, amount is added back to the balance of their loan um, and collected at the time the loan's paid off. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, it really is of no benefit um, for a borrower to not have that coverage in place because right. they're going to still pay for a policy that doesn't do anything for them and, um, and it still comes at a cost. So, okay. so yeah. So, yeah, and I, I think, and you might have seen this too, but you notify someone that they need flood insurance, oh yeah, we'll go buy the policy, and then they just <laughs> purposely let it lapse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we uh, forget they have to yeah, keep that up. There, it's, it's a pretty aggressive uh, uh, set of steps that you follow when you when you have that. Either you, right. either you get the policy in a timely manner, or you have to force place, and that's not something we like to do. Yep. Obviously, it's not a, you know, it's not a, not a, um, a thing that we, we uh, you know, we want our customers to have to go through, but at, but at times, as these maps change and, and and so forth, sometimes that that does occur. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know we get into a lot of details when we or we could talk details all day when we talk about flood insurance. But one question I've always wondered is: is there a limit to the number of structures that can be located on the, on the property under the one policy? Or there there aren't a limit to the number of, of structures that you can have, obviously, but there are a there is a limit to how they can be placed on policies. NFIP policies require that each structure have its own policy. Okay. Um, okay. So if you've got four structures on the on the property that are qualified for flood, then you'll have to have four separate policies. Our experience with the uh, with the uh, private issue is that they can put all poli or all structures on one policy or they can do them individually um, uh, it's it's um, you know there's not a there's not a, a definite definite uh, situation there but but I have seen them both ways on, on on private issue I've seen them all listed on one policy I've also seen them individually broken out so okay but, and you mentioned structures um, you know a lot of folks assume we're talking about <laughs> houses or buildings mm -hmm. that are permanent structures right. Um, let's say you have a mobile home, whether it's a single wide or even kind of a, a temporary, like a double wide. Right. Are those still covered by the same yes. flood insurance policy? Yes, guidelines? flood insurance will be required on on any type of structure that is on there, and and um, um, and it, it really drills down um, as far as what is considered a structure. There's a there's a an, a, a definition of that, uh, but basically, I believe the uh, I believe that it has to have three walls and a roof. So it's pretty, okay. it's pretty, it's pretty broad. Yeah, it's pretty broad. <laughs> so, so there's a, there's a, uh, it doesn't take much to create a structure. Okay. Um, but, okay. Um, so we, uh, you're looking to buy a property and uh, <clears throat> you might know, you do, say you get online, do the FEMA search, whatever, mm -hmm. and it does show up that you're in. Um, and I, I think we may need to <laughs> you purchase yeah. flood insurance on your vehicle. Right now, yeah. <laughs> I've never heard of rain here before. I know, me either. <laughs> yeah. um, so are there any uh, uh, damage prevention measures we can take as a landowner uh, that would maybe prevent the need to get flood insurance or minimize the cost of it? Well, one of the things we kind of touched on earlier was the, um, um, uh, was the location of that structure in relation to that entire property. So um, let's say you have, <clears throat> you have 10 acres <coughs> and the home's located on a higher elevation and, and the property runs down to a creek or a stream or something and that area is in a flood and, and therefore the whole thing has to be considered in a flood. Um, the, the borrower or property owner at that point could, could go out and get uh, what's called a, a site elevation certificate and they can have a they can have a surveyor to prepare those, and and basically what that surveyor is doing is they're going out and they're looking in that area to see what the base flood elevation for that area is, and then they're going to give you an elevation of the lowest level of, of that structure, right. and if your and if your lowest level of that structure is higher than that base flood elevation, it can. Um, Create some circumstances where you can either uh, substantially reduce your premium or possibly eliminate it altogether. And how that works is um, there's a uh, items called a uh, LOMA or a LOMER, LOMER F, which uh, a LOMA is a letter of map amendment, and that's issued through FEMA. Mm -hmm. And the LOMER F is a uh, letter of map revision um, uh, based on fill. So there's um, if if you if you build up out of flood, right. you can actually get a LOMAR F that shows that you did uh, took all the necessary steps and precautions, and you and you've met all the qualifications, to, you know, for that, and and uh, 
can get a, a get a structure out of the flood where flood insurance is not required. Mm -hmm. um, and the Loma, same thing. If they can prove your uh, prove your uh, um, elevation correctly for that structure, you can also avoid it that way right. in some cases. And we've worked a lot. Uh, we've worked a lot with our uh, soil and water conservation office here in Gallia County mm -hmm. over the years, and those folks down there have been very helpful in anything flood related, and they've been good to provide information. Actually, have act uh, helped a few of our customers uh, that I've sent um, actually prepare the uh, Loma application and, and submit it to, to okay. FEMA. So, that's so uh, that's, a, that's a good resource to check in yeah. on also. Okay. Well, and a lot of times you'll see you know some different <coughs> areas, especially in Galpolis. You notice some of the buildings like why are they piling up all that dirt building? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and you'll see all these buildings or restaurants or stores right. built on a higher area they bring in and fill up. Mm -hmm. right. And that's the purpose of that, yeah. is to get that, that business yeah. out of the floodplain. That is, and, and also uh, also you have a uh, factor called participating community. And in order to be a participating community, your uh, um, local um, government, if you will, has to agree not to allow um, structures to be built in a special flood hazard area. Right. Um, if you if you are a participating community and you have a natural disaster fema comes in then you you could be eligible for some disaster aid if you lose that participating community status then um, you're not going to be eligible for any any of that aid so mm -hmm. it's important that uh, you know our local governments um, look after that and make sure they know what what's being built where it's being built and they're taking proper steps to make sure that the uh, elevations are correct so. right okay and, and a, another point too, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if you were to go through the LOMA process or the LOMA F, that's the cost to do that would be the customer's responsibility, not it, that's correct. to pay it would for the be survey. Typically, to, typically a survey um, could, could range, I've seen them range uh, between five and $700. Yeah. Uh, they're, mm -hmm. not, they're not extremely expensive when you okay. consider what you might have in the cost of flood insurance over a period of time. Yeah. Um, uh, additionally, the application, um, unless there has to be uh, other requirements by FEMA, usually there's not a lot of cost in submitting that. Uh, because what they're going to do is they're going to take the work you've already done on the survey and they're going to compare it to their flood maps and their base flood mm -hmm. elevations mm -hmm. and make that determination whether or not it can be removed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, <coughs> prevention's worth a pound of cure. Absolutely. It still holds true in lots of different, <laughs> lots of different things. That's right. So. It, um, is there anything that we've omitted or forgot to talk about today? Um, I know we're running short on time. And, um, uh, I don't think so. Uh, I think I think if, if I had to close with something, it would be this. Um, I think most people have a uh, uh, their home is their is their most expensive investment they're ever going to yep. make. Um, I think when you're when you're looking at buying uh, a, a property, uh, it would it would uh, uh, just be uh, due diligence to, to go out and check check the location, look at the flood maps, mm -hmm. see if you're thinking about building a home or buying a home, look at the properties around it, and uh, and see you know see what the potential dangers and hazards are there before you uh, make that purchase and you can yep. consider that because flood ex flood insurance can be expensive, but uh, given the uh, given the uh, um, you know what you're protecting it's worth it it's worth it it's definitely it's great it. advice yeah. it is so, well I think we're getting short on time I that's think right. and a lot of a lot of great information yeah. especially with the day yeah Pat, apologize we appreciate for you the coming on technical difficulties that's all right that's all right I'm just hoping you have a canoe outside so well. I can get back to my car get back to my car so. it's a good thing that's we right. parked up on the top level <laughs> that's right, right. That's right. right. That's that's right. Bottom. So, anyway well, thank you for joining us, and for Common Sense, I'm Brad Bapst. I'm Ryan Mapes. And we'll see you next month.